up everybody this is F2Z and welcome to a brand new review series or whatever it is that I'm trying to do this is actually EPL series of review that I'm actually gonna do I thought of doing this for a long time just never thought of when to try it when to start it and I just thought maybe now is a good time to start I don't know why just something tells me it would but basically what I'm planning to do is that after every Premier League game, I'm going to try to do a catch-up review session on each of the matches that has happened over the weekend or over the weekdays of the matches that has been going on. So, firstly, I am F2Z, as you guys know. And if you guys are wondering who do I support, it is the one right on top here, the screen here that says Arsenal Tree. Tottenham Hotspur 1 and yes I am an Arsenal fan yes what a win to say the least and that's why I thought maybe you know what a great way to start a review and the first game of the weekend was Arsenal versus Tottenham Hotspur what a what a match this was all right firstly um what a win for Arsenal Thomas Partey scored in the 20th minute and can I just say what a strike that was. That was a fantastic, fantastic strike. He's been doing that since last season, has not put one into the top bins and this time he did. He actually put it in the top bins and I'm actually so happy for him. Before Harry Kane actually equalized by penalty, it was a clumsy mistake by Gabriel Magalhaes. Um, well, not much I could say, but Harry Kane is Harry Kane. He scores in penalties most of the time. And then it was half time. Now, I thought at half time, 1 1, things are still might be even out, but mostly Arsenal played really, really well. And I thought maybe second half might be a different tone. But no, Arsenal came out on the front foot just like it was in the first half even though the score was 1-1 immediately just like 4-5 minutes after the halftime give a Jesus score to make it 2-1 and then Emerson Royale did well did a, did a blunder there so he basically starts up onto the ankle of Gabriel Martinelli and a lot of people questioning whether it's a red card or not deliberate or not I can understand from a certain perspective because you know if you're watching replays on slow motion on replays on slow time you're gonna convince yourself that that is actually a very painful challenge to be honest when i see that i'm like you know what yeah damn right that's a red card and i'm an arsenal fan <laughs> but when i watch it in real time no slow motions when i see the first time and all of a sudden i saw martinelli rolling around and I'm like okay firstly I know Martinelli is not the type of person that will make a meal out of a tackle not like Neymar-ish kind but in real time I thought it was just an accidental stamp on the leg that's why he kind of got that pain from but when you look back convince yourself that it's painful and it's bad enough that it's red sadly that's how referee view nowadays you know they don't view replays on real time they review replays on slow motion, on slow replays. So, enough to be convinced that he's red. Unfortunately for Emerson Royale, but fortunate for Arsenal. Well, Granit Xhaka, what a turnaround this man has been. This guy rejuvenated his career in Arsenal. He's been in Arsenal for over five years. And now we have finally seen what Granit Xhaka is all about. It took him this long to finally see how good he was like when we bought him from Borussia Mönchengladbach I think I butchered the name <laughs> it is what it is Arsenal win 3-1 it was a comprehensive victory as you can see this is from FODMOB love using this app actually and I'm not promoting it this is uh, not sponsored or anything I just love using this app to see the stats and everything so basically, you can see possession-wise, you can see how much Arsenal hold the ball, how much passes we made. 511 over 240. We made 
twice more the passes than Spurs ever did throughout the whole 90 minutes. That kind of says a lot, really. Really, really says a lot. So, yeah. Um, not much to say. Arsenal, top of the table. Yeah, well, let's see where this goes, you know. But personally, if you ask me as an Arsenal fan, I'm not looking for Arsenal to win the title this season because personally, I feel that we should focus more on just getting the top four because that is our priority, basically. It's our priority. Um, am I happy at the moment? Of course I am. Do I sense something bad is going to happen? Definitely. <laughs> Maybe when we meet Man City. But until then, I'm just going to enjoy what we can. <laughs> Moving on to the next game. Moving on to the next game, we have Bournemouth and Brentford. Now, this match ended up in nil-nil. By no means that is a boring game, but it was actually a very evenly matchup because of, well, if you look at the stats here, how much of a point gain for Bournemouth and it's a two-point drop for Brentford. So, in a way, okay, here's the thing. I want to mention one at a time. AFC Bournemouth, ever since they get Scott Parker sacked, they have not lost a game. And that is beyond me. <laughs> How did they actually not lose a single game after Scott Parker left? That is a shocker, to say the least. And for Brentford, I guess by Brentford's standards of Thomas Frank with the players that he has, and look at the stats over here, we can see they have more possession, um, slightly more shots uh total shots definitely higher xg than the bournemouth team um they definitely should have the well you know felt like a two-point drop they they should have won this matchup actually but as you can see uh, bournemouth goalkeeper neto deserved man of the match because he was pulling off the strings and saves and all that he did really really well so fair play fair play for bournemouth who later we're gonna look at the table and see where and who everyone is and share my thoughts with you guys. Moving on in the next game now, Crystal Palace versus Chelsea in the Selhurst Park, where Chelsea won in the last minute, thanks to, well, as an Arsenal fan, I feel sad to say this, but Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang scored his first goal for Chelsea in the league. And that's right, Conor Gallagher, the former loanee to Crystal Palace, who was a shine and the star player of Crystal Palace last season, scored a thunderous, a beautiful strike. And he did not celebrate, which a lot of people like to say he should have. But personally, I mean, hey, you know, if he believes that he shouldn't celebrate, he shouldn't. You know, people shouldn't say like, Oh, you score a bicycle kick, you should celebrate no matter what. I mean, loan is loan, former team is former team, blah, blah, blah. If the man has respect for one club to another, it's his choice whether you want to celebrate or not. So personally, I feel that it's a wonderful strike. Personally, I will celebrate like hell, but fair play. Mad respect for Conor Gallagher, actually. But what do I think about this game? Crystal Palace is looking very dingy at the moment because sure, while they're attacking, they have attacking options, they can create chances, they can score definitely. But their back end now looking a little bit leaky as it seems. They're not really grinding out to hold on to victories in in their home, you know? Because normally in Sel Selhurst Park, it's quite a tough place to visit. But they can definitely pull off results, that's for sure. So as we look at the stats here, I mean, Chelsea immediately turned up the moment they concede in the first seven minutes by Edward. And it was all Chelsea, basically. Uh, number of passes almost twice more, way more XG, because Crystal Palace pretty much only had one chance and a couple of chances here and there. But really, to be honest, they... <sighs> They have definitely, I mean, shots on target both have three, in a way, but Chelsea defense, solid, I would say, very solid. You know, Thiago Silva, Fofana, and you know, if they play, I mean, Graham Potter in Chelsea 
what is my thought? Well, Graham Potter is gonna play defensive, no matter what. So you're not really gonna watch pretty football. You're not really gonna watch fantastic football. But if you're a team or a fan that love to just see a team that just grind off for the result, then this might be the one. Cause honestly, their backline is solid, really. They have Chilwell on the left, Cucurellas on the left, Reese James on the right, Aspilicuetas on the right, your center backs are Fofana, Thiago Silva, Koulibaly, it's over there, they're all there. The midfields, Jorginho, Kovacic, uh, Kante, they have solid players, really, really, really. I really feel that Chelsea should be, should be, with the quality of the squad, should be fighting for the title. Honestly, he should be fighting for the title. But at the moment, it's still early. Um, they're still trying to catch up, I guess, in a way. Uh, just behind by a few points. I believe they can catch up. But title charge may not at the moment. But we'll see how. They, they can pull off a very strong run. I really feel they can. Could be foreshadowing to Arsenal self if we ever face Chelsea. But I hope Aubameyang do not score against us. <laughs> so, yeah, moving on. And next up, we have Fulham 1, Newcastle 4. And can I say Newcastle really needed this victory, don't they? Because so many draws, 6 game winless run. And they finally ended with a victory. And it all started with Nathaniel Chaloba with a red card. Now, what do I think about the red card? Red card really changed the game. Yes, it does. It's so early. I believe it's, yeah, it says at 8 minutes only. Um, yeah, and they just capitalized, really. I mean, it's a very straightforward win. Cal Wilson and Miguel Almiron. Can I just say, Almiron, what a season he's having so far. Even though it's just a few games, he's actually turning up. You know, people are talking about St. Maximin, he's been very dodgy with injury lately. But Miguel Almiron has been turning up so far for Newcastle. And a big loss for Fulham, not just by the score results, not just by the red card, by Alexander Mitrovic. He's, he came off injured. Do we know how long? No, we don't. But let's hope it's not really a long injury. Uh, Kozawa, I believe, came out from injury as well. They are one of their new signings. So they have a couple of problems now. It's a matter of how they're going to bounce back. That's the question. But till then, Newcastle has been my prediction to be at least in the 7th position to get in the Conference League. This is what they deserve at least. But yeah, it's a very much needed win for Newcastle. Unfortunate for Fulham, they need to really regroup on this and see how they can turn this around. And now we move on to Anfield where Liverpool faces Brighton. This match I watched and let me tell you guys this. The first 20 minutes is by far the worst Liverpool performance I've ever seen. I've never seen a side so unprepared in a way so being pressured to a point that actually Brighton should have been 4-0 in the 20 minutes. Trossard did score two goals in that 20 minutes, but there was other two shots that was brilliantly saved by Ellison. And if it wasn't for him, for that brilliance, it would have been 4-0. But fair play, Liverpool, they rally back. Brighton played so well to I don't know, is this considered like points drop for Brighton? Maybe because they were in 2-0 lead, they should have just really maintained that, that performance level. But unfortunately, they didn't. Roberto Firmino gets that one crucial goal. I feel that goal actually is very crucial to get uh, just before halftime to make it 2-1. So it does not feel bad. So when they come out, they can be on the front foot, which they did. Which Firmino did in the 54th minute and then an unfortunate own goal before Brighton had to rally back with Trossard hat-trick in the 83rd. And do I feel that Brighton deserve the draw? Actually, they deserve a win, but the draw is a fair play, especially when you're playing away against Liverpool and Anfield. It's not an easy place. So fair play, actually. And Liverpool as well. A lot of questions. People question about 
Trent Alexander Arnold, the defense, you know, like Simicast, Mati, Van Dijk has been not performing. But question, a lot of questions, very questionable. Trossard, superb, absolutely superb. And Firmino, looks like he's outshining Darwin Nunes at the moment. And that says a lot because when you're a new signing supposed to be starting up front and you're not playing right now, this could be a problem here for Liverpool signing. But I'm hoping that Nunes could actually shine because I think that he has a lot of potential as well. So, uh, of course, under the new manager, Roberto Di Zerbi, uh, let's look at the stats real quick. Very evenly matched up. You can see expected goals is around there, ball possessions around there. They have is a very entertaining match. It's a very entertaining three all match. I think a draw is well deserved by these two. And last of this last of the Saturday match, which is Southampton one, Everton two. I'm gonna touch on this briefly. Lampard superb at the moment. I initially tipped Everton to relegate at one point as well because no offense, Everton is a good club. Everton has decent players. I just don't have faith in Frank Lampard. But at the moment, the two signing he made, Amadou Onana and Connor Cody, superb. Dwight McNeil, superb. This has been fantastic signings and nothing more of a short. They delivered. Onana with the assist for Cody, Dwight McNeil scoring the, well, the apparently winning goal. After going a goal down thanks to Joe Aribo, Southampton also, which I need to mention. Well, yeah. So it was like three goals in a span of like five minutes and it was it was mad for a moment. And Southampton, what I wanna say is they are is Ralph Hassan Hodo rebuilding the squad for the youths. I'm not sure. There's so many young players and so many good players are coming up arising. Like Duja Kaleta Car, that's one of the good signings, but unfortunately they lost. Bella Kochep, one of the young signings. Joe Aribo, I'm starting to love this guy, Joe Aribo. No idea how did they actually get him in. But he is actually gonna be the future of Southampton, and someone from the big club is gonna sign him for sure. I can guarantee that. And same thing with Everton, with Omadu Onana. Solid player as well. I love him as well. Starting to love these players. And if you look at the uh, stats, it's actually more evenly matched than what it is. So do I feel like it's a deserved draw? Maybe Southampton should have taken their chances more. But uh, they do need their midfields to be winning. So as you can see, I think clearly Ainsley Miller now isn't helping much in the midfield, sadly. And yeah, like they need they need to do something about their their midfield i really feel their midfield they need to have more bodies in the midfield than just one person forward really having two strikers like this is not really gonna help i personally feel like che adams up forward have another body in the midfield just playing as number 10 or just in the middle of Milan nows and what prowse could be helpful you know and let aribo and armstrong just run forward just run forward man. you know really so that's my take and yeah moving on to one of the one of the sunday matches which is west ham united to wolverhampton wanderers nil and this match ended up causing bruno large to be sacked after this game and my thoughts is west ham needed this win wolverhampton needed this win both started the season very poorly uh, deserve win for West Ham? Very straightforward actually, yes. Uh, concerning for Wolves? Yes, Pedro Neto is injured and not looking too good at the moment. And now with the signing of Diego Costa, we have no idea how is it going to go. Uh, like who's the new manager that's going to take over for Wolves? You know, and to be honest, it's still early again. It's only been, well, about 70 matches. Um, Points are still very close to one another. But West Ham, finally, Skamaka can finally start his scoring. And Jared Bowen to finish it off with the second goal before... Yeah, I don't want to talk about his hand. But my word, if you guys see, go and check it out. He dislocated one of his fingers or something. It looks nasty. Absolutely nasty. 
but great win for West Ham to say the least. Um, Wolves, I'm really worried. They have good solid players, but the moment you put Ruben Neves at the back as a defender, nah, that's where probably I think it, you know, it kind of crossed the line that Bruno Lage, you're running out of ideas. Probably the selling of Connor Cody is a wrong move for him. They do have a lot of injuries. They are very unfortunate injuries. But however, I feel that they should have enough quality as well at some point. Maybe not against West Ham, but I hope. Maybe against with, like, you know, Bournemouth and stuff. You know, on paper that they can actually win. And I personally think they should. West Ham, Skamaka, Paqueta, solid signings. They are hoping that they can continue this. But I think they're going to focus more on Euros. Uh, in the European competition but we shall see where these two clubs ended up going also one of the Sunday slash well coming towards Monday kind of match I'm just gonna touch on this briefly because no offense this is actually nothing much happened other than Luis Sinistera with a stupid red <laughs> probably the most dumbest way to get red and he did and it's 0-0 zero, zero. Two points drop, definitely for Aston Villa because as you can see, Jera needs to do something. If not, Aston Villa is actually going to struggle and they're not taking their chances. You know, they have 11 players for pretty much the whole of second half and they did not take their chances at all. And it's a well-deserved draw for Leeds. Yes, you know, they draw due to 10 men, maybe. Sinistera, very dumb way to get Rekard. I just couldn't get over that. And I don't understand Jarrah's substitutions. I get it. You have a lot of defensive players and you're trying to move forward. But you bringing in Danny Ings in the 83rd minute makes me question, like, do you actually really want to win? Or are you just scared to just throw forward and in case you get counted? You know, because I get it. It's nil-nil. I'm not saying 10 men you couldn't win. But that extra body in the field could actually change the game. Really, really is. But... It's unfortunate, it's a point gain for Leeds, it's a two-point drop for Aston Villa. Pretty much straightforward. Now... Now... Well, where do I start for this? The second derby of the whole weekend. Manchester City 6! <laughs> Manchester United 3. I almost said now. 3. Wow! So much to take for this. Again, this is one of those where there's kind of both ways to look at this. First half, Man City dominant. Dominant. 4 0 at halftime. Manchester United had nothing to show. Haaland and Foden run the show, with Kevin De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva are the, the one that pulls the strings before Foden and Haaland just finish up the jobs, you know? It's impressive to see how good Haaland is. Words cannot describe enough how good this guy is. He's absolutely mad. I'm actually scared of this guy if you ever face Arsenal. <laughs> but what do I have to say about Manchester United here? Okay, how do I dissect this? Um, okay, tale of two halves. First half, Man City is dominant. Second half, technically Manchester United improve-ish. But... On paper, they kind of win Man City 3-2 on second half, but realistically, it is actually Man City kind of take the step off from the pedal, you know? They don't really want to go all out, which they only score two goals. Um, Anthony, brilliant goal for Manchester United, honestly. Martial coming in two goals could give Ten Hag some options into rotating. Other than that, Man City is just flawless, really. It's perfect. Sure, they may concede three, but I'll be honest, you have a back line of Nathan Ake and Akanji only, and you're already scoring six, uh, conceding only three. Yeah, not much, not much can be said. Not much can be said. You know, when they have Ruben Diaz and Laporte, they can afford to rest them. I mean, it kind of says it all about how good Man City is. I honestly think it's Man City's gonna win the league, and here's my take for this. They might have a chance to win this season unbeaten. I'm saying this right now. Their squad looks amazing, flawless. They should be winning every game. I don't see any other team that can so far win 
Unless, well, you know, they might have one of those funny games or weird games. Or maybe hopefully Arsenal will win. But till then, I don't see any team that can win this Man City side at the moment. It's absolutely strong, absolutely flawless squad. Pep Guardiola has created a masterpiece here. Manchester United, I'm sorry. Here's my thing. Alright? Ten Hag needs to drop McTominay, Bruno Fernandes, and Rashford. Here's why. Sure, yes. Rashford, a lot of people are gonna question, yeah, you know, Rashford scored two goals against Arsenal. You know, this could be the start of Rashford's season again. No, it's not. I'll be honest with you. Okay, it's gonna be one of those one off performances. If I were Ten Hag, I would start with Cristiano Ronaldo up front. Okay, Anthony on the right. And on the left, I'll put Anthony Martial. That'll be a good start. And number 10, number 10, I'll put either Rashford or, um, yeah, Rashford or Ericsson. Rashford or Ericsson to be rotating around. Or maybe Rashford and Sancho to be rotating around with Anthony and Martial around there. Get it? Anthony Martial, Anthony, yeah. <laughs> they, they both name kind of fit. So, um, yeah. Do not put Ericsson as one of the deep lying playmakers, please. You know, put him in up front a little bit. Mac McTominay needs to go. Put Fred and Casemiro so that you have that Brazilian midfield there. They have good understanding. I'm sure they can play. I'm sure they can know their role more. And then we have the wingbacks. Questionable wingbacks. I can't tell much really. Dalo and Malasia struggle. The defender center, well, Varane's injured now. Pierre Martinez. Harry Maguire is probably going to come back or Lindelof. So, we shall see. shall see how it is. But really, I feel that McTominay, Bruno Fernandes and Rashford needed to have a rotation. They cannot cement their position there. They don't deserve it yet. Their form is very bad as of late. You need to rotate them. Really, really. I really felt that way. Um... Yeah, a lot of questions for David De Gea here. 3.5, I mean, really. Some of the shots maybe he could have saved, you know, from the inside of the post, but majority, it's, uh, well, it's a Man City running the show. That's pretty much it, really. And now we look at the table. As you can see, um, Arsenal leading the way of being on top with 21 points, Man City with 20th, I mean, really, it's a matter of time only that Man City is going to overtake Arsenal. Uh, yeah, Spurs drop, uh, still maintaining third after getting their first loss of the season. Brighton maintaining fourth after a major draw, a big point to get, actually. Can you imagine if they were to win Liverpool? They would have been 16 points, actually, and that is amazing. <laughs> And Chelsea uh, climb up to 5th after their win. Man United drop out to 6th. Uh, Newcastle much need a win after 6 winless runs to 7. Uh, Fulham dropping to 8. Liverpool struggling. Really, really struggling. But let's see what they can do against Arsenal next. Um, Brentford to 10. Ev Everton looking solid. Climbing up slowly to 11. Leeds, Bournemouth, Aston Villa dodgy team to go around up and down there's gonna be some more shuffling there West Ham just coming out after the win against uh, Wolves and yeah uh, Southampton Crystal Palace Leicester and Nottingham Forest is something that we need to talk about these two in another time but well until then I hope you guys do enjoy this so-called Premier League review ish yeah <laughs> i don't know how else to call this but hope you guys do enjoy uh if you guys do enjoy do don't forget to press the like share comment down below but what you guys think and subscribe till then i'll see you guys next time take care